the Clery Center. Um, the Clery Center for Security on Campus is a national nonprofit organization dedicated to preventing violence, substance abuse, and other crimes on college and university campuses across the United States and to compassionately assess the victims of these crimes. The Clery Center was founded over 25 years ago by Connie and Howard Cleary following the brutal rape and murder of their daughter Jean in her college residence hall by another student whom she did not know. The Cleary Center's efforts focus around four key areas, advocacy, education, training, and policy. We work collaboratively with students, families, and institutions of higher education to improve campus safety across the country. For more information about our organization, including details about upcoming trainings and events, we encourage you to visit our website, which is located at www.clearycenter.org, as well as follow us on Facebook and Twitter. So let's get started. Today's discussion will focus on how to effectively plan and respond to situations that, quite frankly, we all hope never occurs on our campus, um, an active shooter situation. A recent survey by Campus Safety Magazine found that approximately 25% of campus professionals felt their institution was unprepared to deal with active shooter scenarios um, on their campus. As we've seen just this past week and actually just this morning um, in North Carolina, uh, the number of violent incidences on or near college campuses continues to rise, highlighting the increased need for campuses to prepare and plan for effective immediate ongoing and post-incident response. We're pleased today to have a wonderful group of expert panelists with us this afternoon to discuss these issues and related promising practices. Um, I'll start with Amber Chang, uh, who is the Public Information Officer for Bakersfield College and the Kern Community College District in Central California. Amber has more than 20 years in external relations experience for non, uh, large nonprofit organizations and corporations. She has extensive training in California's emergency management system and has been certified as a public information officer by the United States Department of Homeland Security. Amber is currently partnering with the Bakersfield Police Department to create an eight-hour citywide active shooter all department response training using simulated ammunition and active fires at her college campus. We also have with us Paul Dean, who's the Chief of Police and Executive Director of Public Safety for the University of New Hampshire. Chief Dean is a 28-year veteran of law enforcement and is a graduate of the 186th session of the FBI National Academy and the Babson College Command Officer Training Program in Wellesley, Massachusetts. Chief Dean serves as an adjunct instructor for the Great Bay Community College Criminal Justice and Homeland Security Program, the New Hampshire Police Standards and Training Council, as well as the New Hampshire Fire Academy. He also serves as an instructor in terrorism and emergency management related issues for IACLEA's Homeland Security Program. Chief Dean is the chairperson of the IACLEA Homeland Security and Domestic Preparedness Committee and is the co-author of the highly successful Managing Critical Incidents for Higher Education Institutions, a multidisciplinary community approach from Zenith. Chief Dean also serves on numerous committees at the University of New Hampshire, including the Student Faculty Staff Behavioral Intervention Team Transportation Safety and University Emergency Group. And finally, we have with us Frank Zebedis, who serves as Chief of Police at Winthrop University in Rock Hill, South Carolina, since November 1998. Frank began his law enforcement career in 1985 after receiving his degree in criminal justice from the University of Akron in Ohio. Uh, Chief Zebedis graduated from the FBI National Academy in Virginia and served as both president and vice president of the South Carolina Campus Law Enforcement Association. He is the immediate past chair of the International Association of Campus Law Enforcement Administrators Domestic Preparedness Committee, and has also served on the advisory council for the Campus Safety Journal. In 2005, Chief Zebedis was selected by IACLEA to travel the country and present a course on the incident command system funded through the Department of Homeland Security. And he's also been deemed a subject matter on subject matter expert rather on critical incident response and has assisted in developing classes that are now funded through Homeland Security and FEMA and taught around the country on critical incidents and response. And earlier this year, Chief Sebedis was awarded a presidential award from IACLEA for his work with developing and teaching critical response courses and appointed as the IACLEA Southeast Regional Director. So as you can tell from those very wonderful and long bios, we have an incredibly experienced uh, panel of experts today. Amber, Paul, and Frank, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to speak with us. Absolutely. All right, so we'll get started. Um, we're gonna start 
The structure with a little bit about planning and preparing, we'll move into response of the actual incident, and then we'll talk a little bit about post-incident response. So Paul, I wanted to get started with you. Uh, what elements should be considered when planning and developing a response to active shooter scenarios? Are there any institutional considerations that campuses should keep in mind? Well, thank you, and thank you for the nice uh, in introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone, to our webinar. Uh, the considerations that, that everyone needs to take is, is from a variety of different standpoints, one being uh, environmental. Well, what kind of campus do you have? Do you have a, a residential campus? Are you a, a community college with a commuter campus? Uh, a small institution, large institution, those those foundational things are going to be the basis uh, for your developing uh, of a plan and the, the actual response to a scenario. Uh, one of the other things that, that two are going to play into that is are you a, a sworn uh, campus, meaning you have law enforcement on the campus that are sworn and armed, or, or are you uh, non-sworn and unarmed? Those things are all going to be foundational level things in developing your plan. But most importantly, you need to have components that, uh, to develop your emergency action plan. Those components are going to involve stakeholders, and that's where it comes into the institutional considerations. You need to involve all those people that are critical stakeholders in your institution. And some of those people are, are the facilities folks, the uh, human resources folks, uh, and of course, the law enforcement, but more, more importantly, uh, those public sa safety partners in, in your community, your host communities, uh, they play a, a, a critical role in, in, in the development of your plan so you know what resources are available to you. Thanks, Paul. Um, so, Frank, I wanted to pass this off to you. Uh, from your experience in the, the law enforcement area, how should a campus develop a law enforcement protocol? What are some first steps? Well, Sam, thank you for uh, having me this afternoon, and, and again, welcome to our guests that are, that are with us. Uh, in, in order to develop a law enforcement protocol, a lot of the foundation that Paul talked about is very important. And, you know, in order to be able to set up some kind of protocol to respond to an active shooter, you have to understand your capabilities. And obviously, if you're a, a non-sworn, non unarmed agency, you have certain limitations and challenges that you're going to have to overcome, which would then require you to establish good uh, relationships and partnerships with your local law enforcement and the uh, armed officers or sworn agencies that would be responding. And then if you are an armed agency, you again have different uh, abilities in order to establish your protocol. So your protocol is going to be set based upon your ability to respond, your ability to uh, handle the situation, the type of equipment you have, the training you have, and the level of professionalism that you can bring to that incident if, if something should occur. Thanks, Frank. Um, so Amber, from your experience as a communications professional, your institution is currently planning an active shooter drill that, that we mentioned earlier, um, among other exercises on campus to test emergency notification and response. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you bring agencies outside of your campus um, to that process. Who should really be at the table and how do you get them involved um, in that kind of a, a drill or planning process? Hi, well everyone, welcome to the call. I'm glad to talk with you all today. Um, when it comes to planning an, a drill on campus, you absolutely want to start with who your main local law enforcement is. For us, it's a local police department, and then we escalated there to city and county fire, to the county sheriff's office, to the highway patrol, and it actually went even further when these folks started getting involved. They saw the opportunity that we were presenting to have a, a, a simulated ammunition um, exercise on campus and they all wanted to come and join in on the fun. So it's it's been excellent. But even if it's coming to just planning for an event for an event, planning for a crisis, bringing in local law enforcement, those who would be first to respond to your campus is absolutely essential and it's as simple as making a phone call. There are people on your campus who have those connections. Typically it's going to be your campus police or public safety department. Work with them get them to make those inroads and connections with local law enforcement, and then take it from there. Thanks, Amber. Um, now, we did already get a question, and I just wanted to kind of briefly go into it. So, Paul or Frank, can you touch on some response considerations for a non-sworn armed campus? I know you went a little into this, but I'm not sure if you can add maybe some clarification from a question we just got. Frank, do you want to take that? Sure. 
Uh, well, as far as a, a non-sworn or non-armed, you know, again, your limitations are, are, are there. And establishing those communications with your uh, local law enforcement who's going to be able to respond is very, very important. And, you know, in an active shooter response situation, the response today that is being taught around the country is for those responding officers to respond immediately and go straight towards the threat and neutralize the threat to minimize the damage that that individual is able to, 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 to do. Unfortunately, if you don't have the, the capabilities to meet that threat or meet that challenge, you become part of the problem then. So your response is going to have to be completely different. You might be more involved with, with a perimeter type situation. You might be more involved with a notification type situation. You might be more involved with a sheltering in place situation as opposed to going after that threat. And then, of course, all of this starts with the with the planning and the preparation when you start working with your other local law enforcement agencies. But being unarmed to take on a threat like that, I don't think anybody signs up to go into a threat when they're not prepared, and then you become part of the problem and not part of the solution. Sure. Thanks, Frank. Um, Paul, I'd like to move to you. What role, if any, could students or those unarmed bystanders that, that Frank just mentioned um, play in the planning and response process? Certainly, we know that, that there can be limitations um, for, for folks who are non-sworn, um, but what kind of role do they play um, as community members in the planning and response process? Well, I think anybody uh, would agree that your your student population is is, is your primary um, stakeholder uh, on on any campus. Uh, here at the University of New Hampshire, we've engaged our our student senate, our student uh, body president and vice president, and got them involved in the actual planning planning process to hear what their concerns are, to listen uh, to uh, what bothers them the most. Uh, is 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 good information when you're developing your plan. Also, being very transparent with them about expectations uh, on on what law enforcement will do and what law enforcement will not do um, is, is is very helpful, especially if something uh, happens. One of the, the things that we've done here at the at the University of New Hampshire is taking on uh, the prevention uh, and preparedness role of of training. Uh, faculty, staff, and students ahead of time on what to do if there's an active shooter. I, I believe uh, so much that education uh, it, it makes it makes you powerful. And so if you can know what to expect and to learn about things like you know what gunshots sound like and what to do if you think you hear gunshots uh, is is it is critical to a successful plan. Thanks, Paul. Um, so this next question is for everyone uh, of our panelists. What are some best practices for developing tabletop exercises or active shooter drills? Um, I know certainly, Amber, you're in the middle of planning this, so you may have some interesting thoughts, but I want to open this up to the group. Well, I think one of the best practices is really to bring everyone to the table who might possibly respond to the situation at your campus. Uh, depending on where you're located, it's different aspects of law enforcement and fire emergency response. And you need to make sure that they're all fully aware of the, the limitations and the arrangements of your campus, but also how to, how to manage um, an emergency on your campus when it takes place. So I, I know my colleagues will probably say, you know, bring everyone to the table who possibly needs to be there. Um, and that's what's worked well for us as well. Sure. Thank you. Anyone also, I think it's important that Prior to doing a drill or a tabletop, you have to understand the response. You have to understand the protocols and what you're going to implement when the situation arises. Uh, I know sometimes people try to do tabletops or, or drills, and they have no idea what they're going to do or where they're headed. And when you do that, there's a, there's, there's a waste of time there. So start by developing a plan. Start by developing a protocol then you want to exercise that. And that's the whole concept behind the tabletop and the drill is to exercise the protocol you've already established and educating your administration, your cabinet members on what their role is going to be in the event something happens and include them in your tabletop and in your drills so they know what to do as well if something occurs in real life. And the other part when it comes to, to uh, tabletop and exercising, there has been uh, 
a lot of information uh, over the past several years, especially after the tragedy of Virginia Tech, that there's models that are out there. People don't have to reinvent the wheel, but some of the best resource and information uh, is probably in their states already. Uh, their state emergency management and homeland security departments have certified exercise people who know how to write these, these uh, exercises, who know how to, how to properly exercise, know how to evaluate them so you get the best information back based on those plans that Frank has told you about. Uh, developing and a lot of this is still federally funded so you may be able to go to those the, to the Homeland Security Emergency Management Department and apply for grant funding either by yourself or in collaboration you know with your host community or those other law enforcement agencies that that maybe serve uh, some of your campuses your satellite campuses get that money get that help uh, and, and bring those evaluated it, evaluators in so you can build a strategic plan on how to protect your campus. Thank you guys, that, that was wonderful. Um, we actually just got a question in about tabletop exercises, so I want to just move to that real quickly while we're on the subject. Um, the individual participating said, we're in the process of having a tabletop exercise on active shooter at my university. Uh, we're just involving employees on campus that would deal with it during and after the incident. Should students be involved also in that process? Absolutely. I, I don't know of any planning that shouldn't involve some leadership uh, from, from students. And that, that, that relationship needs to start um, uh, immediately and, and, and get, getting their buy-in uh, so that they understand uh, what, what's going on. I, I would at least reach out to the, the student government leadership and, and ask for a representative. Most have a representative to public safety uh, that, that's assigned through their senators. The other thing I would like to say about that, and I couldn't agree with Paul more, but you know, most of our training that goes on today is for law enforcement responders and how the police are going to respond and what they're going to do when they get there. And I, I think we miss the boat too much by not training and educating the people that are going to be there that have to survive until the police get there. So we need to educate these people, and we need to train those people on how to survive and what to do until law enforcement arrives, and then educate them on what to do when law enforcement gets there. So including them in your drill is a great way to educate them and get that word across the campus, because let's face it, most of our campuses, it's predominantly our students. Sure, faculty, staff, and employees make up a portion of it, but we're there because of the students, and it's going to be the students that are going to need to know what to do. So including them in the drill prepares them in case something does happen. Sure, absolutely. Thank you both. Um, so finally, I'd like to wrap up kind of the planning portion of our discussion by asking each of our panelists, what are some of the key components that you should be including within an emergency plan? Any takers to go first? <laughs> go ahead, Paul. I'm sorry, the technical difficulties are on my end. Oh, no worries. Well, I'll Did you need me to Paul's, oh, While Paul's figuring it out, I'll jump in here. And obviously, based on my background, I'm going to say communications are a very important aspect of the emergency plan. And that's both before, during, and after. It is just as important to communicate before an issue on campus about your training and your preparation and making sure that everyone knows what's going on. My colleagues on the phone have said it right now. The students need to know what they need to do in an emergency, and that's that sort of pre-communication that's very important. And then communicating during and after the event as well to try to get that return to business as usual, which helps so many people recover from a catastrophic event. All of those are very important parts of your plan. Sure, absolutely. Also, just to kind of dovetail off of that, you know, emergency plans, they start with, with preparedness. And you're, you're going you're gonna to prepare, you're going to respond, and you're going to recover. And when you write your plans, those are the things that you have to look at. You've got to look at preparing for the event to happen. How do we prepare for it? How do we respond to it? And then how do we recover afterwards? And including those three parts, I think will be very beneficial as you establish a some type of an emergency plan. I also think you also have to remember that you have to look at an all hazards approach on your emergency plans. Let's face it, when the explosion takes place, we don't know it was a terroristic explosion until hours later, maybe days later. As all we know is we had an explosion. 
So don't get so focused on saying all of our responses are going to be specific. Instead, make them general and make it an all hazards approach when you set up your emergency response plans. Sure, absolutely. Well, that's a great segue to for moving into kind of the, the incident itself. So how do we respond? Um, and certainly we recognize that particularly with these incidents, it, it is going to be a unique case-by-case -case basis. It's, it's very difficult, if not impossible, um, to, to plan and prevent these types of things um, from happening. So um, given the unique nature, thinking about, okay, how do we respond effectively when it's actually occurring? So my first question for Paul or for Frank um, in your role as law enforcement um, professionals, what are your first priorities when faced with um, an active shooter scenario or similar emergency on your campus? Paul, are you back up and running? I am. Oh. I, I am. Go ahead. Some of the some of the first things is is that um, law enforcement is going to uh, when the, the the priority is is obviously to stop the shooter. Uh, law enforcement is going to be responding to where where the where the gunshots are, and that is that is a little bit different to to some of the other uh, emergencies that you're going to respond to uh, on on campus. The, the most of these incidents are over between eight and fifteen minutes, and so it, it's critical that the responding officers uh, when they when they arrive. Uh, are, are, are going to go right in, and I think people uh, sometimes uh, will will not understand uh, why officers can't wait uh, and 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 talk to them or or, or stop and, and and help them when in fact the uh, the role is of that officer to go in and stop that shooting. I guess very quickly to to summarize it, our first objective is life safety, and then our second is obviously property. So our objective initially is to preserve life and save life. That, that's what we're going to do first from the law enforcement standpoint. Thank you both. Um, I, I wonder, Amber, in your role as a communications professional, a similar question, what, what would your first priorities be um, when considering how to notify the campus community about a, an emergency or an ongoing threat to your campus? But one of the most important things is working in and getting information from law enforcement to understand not only what is going on, but the constraints of what they want you to publicly say. Because there may be the tactical response actions that they're going to be taking. They may want certain elements revealed or not revealed. So it's understanding clearly the parameters under which you should be speaking. Um, and then also making sure you're doing your best to notify your entire campus and, and your community as well when there's a threat and really taking advantage of those sorts of um, tools like social media, text messaging, and, and those other elements to make sure that you're getting the message out as broadly as you can. Sure. And I wonder too, I know Amber in your role you also deal with, with media relations. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about um, tensions that you might anticipate experiencing. I know you mentioned that it's about working closely with law enforcement to know what you can and can't say. Um, but can you talk a little bit about how you balance those roles as emergency communicator as well as uh, a media relations professional? It can be tough because as the communications, as the public information officer in the ICS role, you have a very defined role in an active event. But it's really important that you're keeping the community up to date. And in our structure, I also do the emergency communications for the campus. So it can be quite confusing. Um, there may be things that you need to tell your internal folks through your emergency notification that will keep them safe, and then things you need to tell the public about what's taking place. So it's really important to understand the constraints of your role and to really have that training as a PIO to make sure that you're following protocol to the best of your ability. And then you've got to stay in touch with your leadership, with your incident commander, with those who are running the situation to make sure that your information is up to date and current as of when you need to deliver it. Great. Uh, Paul and Frank, I'd like to toss this next question to you. What types of precautions can an institution take for early intervention of, of a threat to campus? What, what would your first steps be um, in that area? Well, I think some of the emerging issues uh, that have that have come uh, over the last several years is the development of behavioral intervention teams uh, on campus. Uh, I I can't emphasize that enough. How critical it is. Uh, for institutions to have teams that are made up of 
of those key offices uh, on on campus uh, who interact uh, w with students. At the University of New Hampshire, uh, we have uh, the dean of students, who uh, who we call the gatekeeper in, on the on the team. Uh, and we have the Counseling Center, Health Services, Academic Affairs, uh, Residential Life, uh, and, 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 and Law Enforcement who meet bi-weekly uh, to discuss uh, cases coming out of the different uh, areas on campus. It could be campus apartments, it could be uh, residential halls, and most of our referrals come from faculty and, and, and in the classroom. And so it's, it's important. And last year we had some 84 cases at the University of New Hampshire that our behavioral intervention team uh, had, had uh, access to and, and discussed. And we have a, an extremely good success rate of getting students help that need help. But also I really think we've done a lot to, to, to stop uh, potential acts of violence from happening on our campus. Sure. And on that subject, um, Paul, we, we just got a question um, on the subject of behavioral intervention teams. Um, is it important to have it for both students as well as employees, or do those teams work better if it's only focusing on one or the other? What, what would you think? Well, I think I, you need both teams, and let me tell me why you need two teams, because because you have two very distinct ways of handling things. Um, here, here at the University of New Hampshire, uh, students uh, are are handled uh, very differently than it, than employees. Uh, students uh, can be uh, academically uh, dealt with and, and and administratively dealt with uh, if they don't go to mandated counseling. Uh, they don't do certain certain things as 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 deemed by the the uh, the dean of students. However, when it comes to to faculty uh, and staff, you have faculty who who may be under contract, so there may be some contractual uh, issues in 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 dealing with with uh, them, and also uh, within with uh, staff human resource issues of employment laws. There there could be literally three different areas. Uh, that that could impact, but having those teams uh, uh, available uh, to deal with those is 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 absolutely critical. It's getting the information out. Each will be dealt with in its way, but uh, there's I, I don't think having a one team um, cookie cutter do all is, is is going to be completely effective. Thank you, Paul. Um, so I wanted to move Amber you know, in your role as communications professional. I know we talked a little bit about you know juggling the media relations piece. You know your role as an internal communicator. Um, a lot of times at our trainings, we'll get a lot of questions about well, how do I how do I best plan from a communications perspective to do these types of, of notifications for our community? Is it a good idea to have uh, pre-scripted messages or some type of template available so you can quickly um, fill in the details? But how, how does that work for your campus? I think Paul used a good word that I want to bring up, and the word is cookie cutter. And I think it's perfectly fine to have pre-scripted messages in your arsenal, but to be prepared to customize them as events unfold. It's um, quite impossible to anticipate every potential eventuality that may touch your campus in a crisis situation. So you need to have some basic messages ready to go and then be able to edit them from anywhere. Uh, most everyone can tell you that things go wrong on your campus typically when you're not there. So you need to have your smartphone, your, your laptop, everything ready to go to be able to communicate about an emergency. And if you have standard language that you want to include in your emergency communications, then you need to have those pre-scripted and ready to go. Um, I use Blackboard software for emergency notifications. And yes, I have pre-scripted messages. I also save all of my past messages as potential templates because I never know if something's going to, re what's going to happen again. Uh, one of our biggest crises in, in recent years has been Grand Theft Auto. And so I've just saved, I've unfortunately saved our Grand Theft Auto messages and had them ready to go when I have to do another announcement to our constituency about auto theft. So I think it's really important, but remember, you need to change them and alter them with the situation. You need to verify the information in them. So have them, have them ready to use, but make sure you're reviewing them before you distribute them. Yeah. 
Thank you, Amber. Um, and this may be something you know we we should touch on. I think a lot of times our training participants also mention you know what does that approval process look like or what should it look like? Um, and this can be a question for for any of you. Um, but it, should it be something that's confirmed all the way up to the top? Should it really be something that's that's you know designated for one person who's kind of closest to the situation? How does that work on on each of your campuses? Well, I'll jump in real quick because I'm fortunate and then I'll let the, the others chime in. Um, I work very closely with the chief of our public safety and when something happens, he and I make the determinations about the messages. We do inform leadership. We let them know what we're sending out and why, but there's no real opportunity to review the messages. Every one of those layers adds additional time when you sometimes time is of the essence. So. Um, we, we have a good situation where the chief and I work well together. We stay in constant contact and many times he fills me in on a situation, I write a message, he reviews it and we go with it and then we notify leadership so that they're aware of what we're doing and why. At the University of New Hampshire, I do, it, it's, it's very similar but uh, the authority is drilled right down to the dispatcher and, and the on-scene supervisor. When a call comes in for, for an active shooter, um, locating me or, or one of my commanders, uh, it, it may not may not be the most sufficient uh, way of getting things done. So I have I have put that authority right in the hands of the dispatcher, the dispatch supervisor, and 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 the and the responding uh, supervisor to the to the scene. Getting that information out as fast as as you can is is, is critical. Um, put, putting a more substantial message out uh, once we're on scene and we exactly know what's going on is 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 absolutely critical. Like Amber said, but getting that uh, getting that initial message out to people so people know what's going on it, 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 it in my opinion it's going to be drilled right down to the lowest common denominator and that's your shift supervisor and dispatcher yeah I would agree with both Amber and Paul you have to you have to empower your people to make the decision and put that notification out the other thing I would like to say too and I know that it, it's very difficult at times for administrators to relinquish that authority to do that because they're worrying about other things. They're, they're looking at reputation and, and things of other nature and, and the political part of the stuff that, that comes into play. But the other thing I would like to say to those administrators is that you have hired people and you have put them in positions of authority and you've given the, giving them the authority to make those decisions. So if you had the confidence to hire them, you got to have the confidence in allowing them to put that message out. And at the end of the day, it's going to bode well for everybody. Thank you. Those are great insights. I also wanted to just conclude. We have about 10 minutes or so before our Q&A portion um, starts up. Wanted to conclude with a, a segment on how to respond, how to follow up um, the recovery process, as Frank very aptly called it, uh, following up after an active shooter scenario on campus. So my first question. Um, Paul or Frank, either of you can tackle this. From a law enforcement perspective, what are some considerations that colleges and universities should keep in mind following an active shooter situation on their campus? What are the priorities? What are the challenges? Um, if either of you could kind of tackle that. Well, I, I think immediately following an incident of this nature or, or any, any critical incident, you're going to have chaos. It's going to be chaotic. Uh, there's going to be a lot of un, unknowns. Uh, there's going to be a lot of confusion, and you're going to have to understand that, that there's going to be a lot of questions. The media, and, and Amber can, can probably address this a little bit better, but the media is going to come from all over. You're going to have a huge media response, and media that you never even knew existed is going to show up on your campus. You're going to have law enforcement agencies that are going to come from all over. So there's going to be total chaos that you're going to have to deal with. You're going to have the reputation of the institution that you're going to have to deal with. You're going to have the victims, and I think we miss the victims too much, and the families of the victims. Not just the family, I mean, not just the victim themselves, but you're going to have to deal with the family victims as well. And uh, so those are some of the things I think you're going to have to be thinking about. Those are things you're going to have to consider, and it's early, it's never too early to think about that. And a very good response and recovery starts with preparation, and it starts with the beginning of your plan. So if you prepare for those challenges at the beginning, you're going to be able to tackle them a lot better at the end. And your recovery time is going to be shorter, and you're going to come out of it a lot better. 
you know, I, I just want to add to to what Frank had had to say. That was that was that was excellent. Is is one of the things though that that we we consistently forget are those are those first responders uh, in the aftermath uh, of uh, uh, following uh, the, the the active shooter situation. Um, taking care of your first responders, your, your police officers, your 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 fire EMS. Your your people that are that are that may be in, in, inside the building, they they are going to need um, some assistance. The, a, a critical incident debrief team uh, should be brought in. They need to be able to talk uh, to to somebody. I, I I think we 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 so much concentrate on what's going on uh, there that we that we forget about those who pre, who protect us, and we got to make sure that uh, they stay well. Uh, and and are, are able to be prepared for the for the next time. Amber, did you have any follow up thoughts on that? Well, I think Paul and Frank both said two things that are essential from the communications perspective, and that's making sure that your messages are where they belong. Your messages are with the the safety and well being of those involved in the situation, and the emotional distress of those who are the family members of those in the situation, and then the hard work and effort of the first responders. My campus is one without sworn officers, without weapons. And so we know that when my public safety goes in, they are basically controlling the situation from the outside, letting no more potential victims in, and awaiting police department to rush in head first and take care of the situation. And you've got to absolutely keep the mind of the local law enforcement into your talk and your messages, and it, it's essential. It's, um, anyone with training and communication knows that showing compassion is one of the most important tools you have in your weaponry when it comes to communicating in a major event. And, and Paul and Frank, they both highlighted the two key pieces, which is your victims and your, your first responders. Thank you. And I want to see, Amber, too, if you could talk a little bit about, uh, I know this was something we discussed in our planning calls, was you know, the, the idea of social media and how it really has kind of changed the game a little bit in terms of managing some of those existing tensions in terms of post-emergency communications. Um, can you talk about maybe balancing or how you would balance those competing interests and perspectives and uh, methods of communication following an incident like this? Well, social media is going to be where I base the bulk of my comments, and this is what you have to remember. Social media is wildfire. Um, it's a good term for any of those folks out in the southwest like I'm at. Um, and we all know how fast wildfire moves. And, and you have an unlimited number of citizen reporters walking your campus. And so you have to remember, in a major event, social media is where folks go. Um, think about things that are taking place in the world or things that are taking place in the U.S. And, and typically, depending if you're at the office, your place, place, first place you're heading is Twitter or Facebook to get information. And you have to remember that your communities and your constituencies are doing the same. So make sure you're keyed into to social media. Make sure you have a network of people to help distribute your information because all they have to do is reshare. One of the key things that I do when I'm making a major announcement is I say, you know, please post this, reshare this, and that way you can try to fight and do some rumor control from what the citizen reporters are seeing, and you can get your information out there. And then you have to remember, the media are going to be all over your campus. They're all going to have a point of view. They're all going to be seeking someone who experienced the situation firsthand. And so you have to do your best to make sure your messages are on point and in coordination with what law enforcement wants you to talk about. And that's the only way you're going to survive. And then it's about showing that appropriate compassion and using social media to try to put out little bits and pieces of information of what took place in a way to really try to get your messages out in, in a solid and accurate fashion. You're going to be fighting against the citizen reporters. And it's not an easy thing to do, but you can do it. Thank you, Amber. Um, and my last question before we open up the, the Q&A portion, I just wanted to ask each of our panelists how important the, the process of follow-up communications and response is in active shooter situations. Certainly we've gone over a, a lot of the specifics, but uh, in a larger context, what role does uh, that kind of follow-up play in helping the campus community heal and recover? Well, I think, I think follow-up communication is very important because when you have an incident of that magnitude taking place on a campus, you're going to have a lot of fear. You're going to have a lot of panic. You're going to have a lot of distrust. And as an institution, you've got to recover from that. You have got to, to instill confidence and safety back into your students, to your employees, to your prospective students. 
So it is very important that after an incident of that magnitude, you do everything possible to recover and recover in a way that's going to get your enrollment back up and it's going to get your 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 community, not just your campus community, but your community, your surrounding community, to feel confident and comfortable being on that campus and around that campus again. You know, and, and I, I can't emphasize that enough. I, I ironically... Uh, today, that that shooting in, in Durham, North Carolina, impacted me in just a little bit of a way that I think is appropriate for this conversation. Um, I received a call from a frantic parent um, wanting to know if her daughter was safe after my police shot somebody on, on my campus. And, and of course, she got it mixed up from Durham, New Hampshire to Durham, North Carolina. But, but the fear in her voice and whether her daughter's safe and what we were going to do to protect her daughter until she could get here, I can only imagine the amount of phone calls that that institution received. So I, it's absolutely critical that the institutions are, are, you're out there and you're getting information, good, solid information about what's going on. Is your community safe? Are people safe? Reunification areas, how to get a hold of, of, your, of your son or daughter on, on campus. I, I can't emphasize the communication enough. I heard the fear in that, that woman's voice today, and I, and, 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 and I ended up calling her back and speaking with her, and she found that her daughter was okay and apologized for calling me and getting the wrong place. But I, I can tell you that uh, the short conversation I had with her, that, that fear was her number one thing. Yeah, Paul, yeah. something really important here is that um, there's a lot of times when something happens at another campus, it's a good time for people to question your practices and, and a good time for you to review what you've got in place, especially as the things that happen on various campuses change. Uh, back in June, a, a college in California, Santa Monica City College, had something that happened off campus come to campus. Um, and seven people ended up dead as a course of the event, including a couple of staff at the college. And that's an opportunity, I mean, for lack of a better word, but it's an opportunity to review what you've got when something comes to you. And it's all about making sure your messages are solid and be really be willing to answer the same question over and over again and put out your information as much as you possibly can because people need to be reassured and they have to be reassured one by one. Otherwise, you're not going to be successful. So make sure your compassion is in place. Make sure your facts are in place and really address those head on, um, like Frank was mentioning. Thank you all. Um, before we begin the Q&A portion of our presentation, I just wanted to, to check with our panelists to see if there was any final thoughts or takeaways that, that you'd like to emphasize that we may not have already covered. And if not, we can move on to Q&As if, if the panelists feel comfortable. Yeah, we can move on. I'm good. All right, great. Well, we have lots of great questions, um, so hopefully we'll get to all of them. If we do not get to your question, please feel free um, to contact the Clery Center. Um, we have our contact information available on uh, the GoToWebinar landing page, but it, please feel free to, to ask as many questions as we can. We'll try to get to as many as we're able to. Um, so the first question we had kind of went back to the planning portion. Uh, I know, Paul, you mentioned the importance of having students involved in tabletop exercises and similar planning pieces. Um, this question was, you know, when should students be involved? Is that immediately in the process? Uh, should it really be something that police, administrators, emergency responders are doing first and then reviewing with students? What would that process look like ideally? Well, the process um, can can look like a variety of ways, really based on the demographics of, of your of your campus. If you're a, if you're a small school, um, you may you may utilize um, students in a, in, a, in a different way than uh, the University of New Hampshire uh, might. But I can tell you that at the beginning, when you're when you're planning uh, and you're developing your plans, having student input is critical. I know at the University of New Hampshire last uh, April we did a uh, active shooter uh, scenario uh, with with simunitions and students from our acting department uh, got involved and actually received received academic credits for being involved in the program. Not only did they get a lesson about their campus safety, but they also academically received um, some some credit from and they just did an awesome job about being a, a actors and making the situations as, as realistic as, as humanly possible. So I think there's a variety of, of, of times throughout the entire process. 
students can be brought in, the recovery process, what, bringing student leaders in uh, to, to help identify uh, those key recovery areas. So I, I think that's really up to the institution and, and wherever they feel uh, they can bring students in. But I think it's absolutely necessary that they're not ignored. Okay. Thank you. And if you don't mind me chiming in. Oh, sure. Absolutely, Amber. We are planning our event, and law enforcement said no students anywhere. And that is because of how intense our event is going to be, and some of the tactics and efforts are secret. Um, and so they basically, we are going to cordon off an area of the campus. Our event's taking place on a day when the campus is not open to students, but we will have staff here. And we basically need to keep the public out. So that public information officer gets role gets even more complicated because I need to promote that we're doing this exercise but not talk too much about what's taking place and try to keep the public out at the same time. So tabletops are great because it helps get the students familiar with the, with the policies and procedures but remember sometimes an exercise law enforcement may not want them around. And that's a great point. We actually had a question that focused specifically on how detailed should you be getting um, whether it's in your communications about active shooter drills or tabletop exercises or your emergency plans. Um, so Paula, Frank, I don't know if you have any perspective on that from a law enforcement background. What should you be sharing? How transparent can you get without potentially compromising um, you know, your ability to respond in an actual situation? Well, at Winthrop, we've, we've put a lot of our plans on our emergency website, and a lot of those plans are for their, their general information. It's what we want our public and our community to know in order to stay safe. We don't get down into the weeds on the tactical uh, maneuvers or the tactics or the tactical approach that our officers or the, the surrounding agencies may take when they intervene. But we do give them enough information that they can respond if an event occurs. So I think you can become, you know, you can give too much information, but then you can say, well, I'm not going to give anything, and then at the same time, you're not giving information you should, and it can become detrimental if, if the situation really arises and, and somebody needs to respond, because obviously if they have no knowledge, they can't respond accordingly. Sure, absolutely. Paul, did you have any thoughts on that front? It's just important to make sure your community is, is aware of what's going on. It, it's not uncommon to read across the, the listservs uh, or, or other, or other uh, publications where institutions have, have spent a lot of time doing a, an active shooter uh, scenario only to find out they didn't communicate properly with, uh, with uh, the, the faculty and staff in the community. And, you know, people thought there was really an active shooter situation going on when, in fact, it was a was a drill. I I I I like the uh, the avenue that Amber's uh, school is taking. They're doing it on a day when they're when the students aren't in session. Uh, I think I think that's probably the the best. But if if that's not available to everybody, letting people know what's going on is just is is just really important. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Can if I jump in with an interesting? Oh yeah, absolutely. Bit? Um, as we, I'm sorry, we're doing all this planning, and one of the, the training officers said, you know, we're going to really expose the holes in your system. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, we're going to use your website as ammunition against you. So we're going to see what have you put out there? What have you made available to the bad guys? And that's how we're going to design this exercise. And we're going to have a full exercise script. And part of what it is is they're going to find a car in the parking lot that is wide with incendiary devices and it's going to have schematics and plans and things that are available on our website. So they're going to basically poke holes in what my colleagues on the phone are saying, which I understand completely. You need to have people completely understand what your plan is, maybe not to the tactical sense, but what you're doing to try to stay safe, but you also, also remember that same information is available to the bad guys. Sure, absolutely. Um, one of our questions that, that just came through was um, it, sort of how do you balance um, the roles or, or get administrative support or administration support rather um, and administration buy-in into this whole process. We've gotten a lot of questions that focus on, you know, how do I get my president to have buy-in in the planning process, um, as well as how do I um, stop getting grief uh, as a law enforcement officer when I send out notification messages um, from the upper echelon of the institution. Um, do, do any of you have thoughts on sort of how to navigate those internal politics? Yeah, I think Paul or I could either one answer this question because it's a great segue for for information on our uh, management 361C course, which is one of the courses provided by IACLEA, and it is an actual 
executive overview. And what it does, it is strictly designed for the cabinet level people, your president and his or her cabinet. And we talk exactly about that, what their role is, the importance of their role, why these folks are doing what they do. So I know not everybody can have this class come to their, to their campus. So I think to answer that question, you have got to get to the top and you've got to spend some time, 15, 20 minutes if they can give it to you and you have to explain to the administration why you're doing what you're doing, how you're doing what, they're, what you're doing and what their role is going to be in what you decide to do. You've got to get buy-in at the top and if you can't get that buy-in at the top, it's going to be a very, very difficult challenge going forward from that point on. I, I can't stress enough what what Frank has said. You know, one of the one of the things that uh, I've noticed uh, with with Frank as we travel across the United States, um, putting on this course for presidents and their cabinets, is is that you know we're able to meet with the the public safety director or police chief on that campus, learn some of the issues, and you know sometimes you're just not a prophet in your own village. You can go in and, and say things, but somebody like uh, Frank or I or somebody else in the area can come in and speak, and, and, and they get it. Um, it. It's important they get the information uh, there. It's about building relationships, uh, you, in, and, and if you're not the best one, you need to find the right medium, somebody to, to talk to and get to them, but it's absolutely critical. If you don't have that buy-in, everything that we're talking about today becomes that much more difficult to accomplish. And, and I also think you have to have people that can talk the same talk. And no disrespect to outside police and law enforcement agencies, but coming onto a college campus, you know, trying to come in and explain to them why you're doing what you're doing, sometimes that doesn't go over as well with an administration where they might be able to hear it from somebody within a college or a university setting telling them that, that same message. Sure. Amber, did you have any thoughts on that topic? Um, I think one of the, the key elements would be it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Um, and it could even be some something happening at an organization in your immediate area and it's going to touch you, it's going to affect you. So it, it has to be, folks have to be reminded that unfortunately this is a reality we're dealing with now. And, um, and sometimes it does take that outside person kind of saying and, and providing a sense of levity and, and making sure that it's, it's clear that you need to prep for these and you need to have buy-in. I can tell you when we first started talking to PD about this event and we were talking about stimulated ammunitions, which um, Frank and Paul can kind of clarify, but I believe they're like paint, but it's not exactly paintballing. Um, right. They wanted to do this inside a building. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, my president's going to say, no way, we're not going to you know, spray the walls with paint and we're not going to shoot people with, with stimulated ammunition. And she was in. She was all in, and she's like, you want to blow up a car in the parking lot? Go for it. We need to have our law enforcement familiar with our campus, and we need to exercise our campus response. And I was fortunate, but really I thought she was going to tell me no way. But it's, we've been trying to message her, and unfortunately there was a shooting at Taft High School. There was actually a, a, an actual bomb at North High School, both in our immediate area, the shooting at Santa Monica College. These all kind of brought reality home for her and really got her to buy in. Thank you all. Those are great insights. Um, I want to, one of the last questions, I think, because it looks like we're running out of time. Um, Amber, I'm going to start with you on this question because it deals specifically with your role as a public information officer. The question deals specifically with how important it is or is it important for that individual to have either a, an, a professional law enforcement background or at least um, some level of knowledge or experience in terms of, of law enforcement. Um, could you maybe speak to that a little bit? So from the communication point of view, like what that person's background should be? Sure, absolutely. Well, um, I don't have a law enforcement background, but um, I have been trained till I'm blue in the face, and I'm kind of a junkie when it comes to this. Um, so it made it easy for me, but you have to be able to speak the language. I know I was sitting at the table with law enforcement all over the place, and this really scary SWAT guy across the table was throwing out acronym after acronym, and I understood what he was saying. It was helpful especially because I'm going to have to be the one communicating about the exercise, it's that whole dual role thing. Um, it's important to understand. It's also important to be appropriately trained because something taking place on your campus is going to be communicated to the world by the PIO. 
And if the PIO doesn't know the limitations and the parameters of what they're supposed to re release publicly, things can go really, really bad. So I try to keep my training fresh. Um, I have a catalog of training background. And one of the best ones that I could recommend is um, the Emergency Management Institute, back, actually back east because I'm in California, but um, through the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, it's fabulous. And it really prepares you in an actual sort of live exercise. We had a flooding in a town as our simulated exercise. And it was a great way to, to understand what you're supposed to communicate, who you need to be in touch with before making those communications, and what you're supposed to do. So I'd say if you're not LE, get yourself some serious training and keep that training up. That's great. Thank you so much, Amber. Um, before we wrap up, Frank and Paul, we've, we've gotten a couple questions for you to repeat the name of your training, just in case folks want to look up more information about the work that you all do. Well, it, it's in the, uh, the is it Homeland Security catalog, Paul, or is it TEAPS? FEMA. FEMA catalog, it's Management 361 and, and Management 361C. The Management 361 course is an actual three-day course and then the 361C course is a executive overview course. And what it does, it takes a, a three-hour block out of that three-day course for strictly your administrators. The three-day course is more for the troops on the ground or the boots on the ground kind of folks. Wonderful. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Um, so I think, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Um, I have to say thank you so much to our wonderful group of uh, panelists. On behalf of the entire staff of the Clear Center, I would like to thank you all for sharing your time and expertise with us this afternoon, um, as well as thank, again, our, our sponsor, Blackboard Connect, who really made this conversation possible through their generous support. Um, this discussion is so important, and we're really grateful that you were all able to join us today, uh, and also for the important work that you do to keep campus communities safer every day. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everybody.